I will ask our colleague Dushan Grich to join me here for presentation. Free software for analog and digital design. Thank you. Oof. Ah, thank you. Uh, my name is Dusan Vujic. I'm uh, an assistant professor here at School of Electrical Engineering, and I'm going to talk to you today about free software for analog and digital design. Uh, the emphasis of the free software for analog and digital design will be on the chip design, but most of the points apply to other areas such as discrete or uh, FPGA uh, digital design. So. Uh, the general points are still valid. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the agenda. Uh, I will make a short and, of course, incomplete uh, historical perspective because it would take uh, the whole conference to, to make a complete historical perspective. Uh, then I will talk uh, briefly about tools for uh, digital design, tools, tools for analog design, and make some concluding remarks. So, uh, this is brief history of uh, circuit design. So in 1959, the first integrated circuit was made by Robert Noyce. And this was the first real integrated circuit. Before that, there were some hybrids which looked like integrated circuits, but in the today's sense, this, is, this was the first one. And a few years after that, in 1965, Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, uh, made the prediction you are all aware of called Moore's Law, that complexity will exponentially increase for at least 10 years. Uh, it lasted for 50 years now, and on the left-hand side, you can see the Intel uh, 4004, which was made in 1971, with feature size of 10 micrometers. You can almost see the individual transistors on this chip, and this was designed by hand, so paper and pencil, Schematics are still available, so you can download the actual schematics of the, uh, this processor. Not that you will understand anything from it because, you know, it's on a transistor level, so it does not convey too much information. And fast forward 50 years, so we have seven, almost seven orders of magnitude increase in the number of transistors in the Apple M1 processor. Uh, in this... Um, Maybe the, 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 the viewers at the, uh, their homes can see it better, but in this photo, you can barely recognize the cores. So, you know, the whole processor, the whole CPU is, is very tiny in this, in this image. That can give you a sense of, of the progress that has been made. And each of these cores, which are tiny blocks in this whole chip, is actually um, too, too much, uh, it has much more complexity than Intel 4004. So it's almost un uncomprehens uncomprehensible uh, how much uh, this has evolved. And the Apple one, M1 has 16 billion transistors on one silicon die. So it is 16 followed by nine zeros. It's a very big number. So this is what we are facing. At first, um, the increasing, the exponential uh, increase of the number of transistors was welcome. So the, the engineers saw it, oh, great, we have more transistors. We can pack more stuff on a chip and reduce the number of chips. But uh, as you can see, the human capacity is constant. It hasn't changed in the meantime. So at one point, those two intersected and we have a problem. That problem was encountered in the 70s. So, you know, it, it was a long, long time ago. Before that, the chips were designed with paper and pencil. After that, the CAD computer-aided design tools were, uh, let's say, a necessity. Of course, paper and pencil is st still used for concepts, but for uh, simulation, for getting the, the, you know, the most out of the, of the chips you need CAD design tools. But uh, in the late 70s, uh, Mead and Conway uh, have triggered a VLSI revolution by doing two things. The first thing is that they recognized that the um, uh, design rules for uh, CMOS processes, regardless of the uh, manufacturer of the foundry and uh, on the uh, process node, are uh, 
are uh, scalable. So the ratios of different things are constant or almost constant. So they have, uh, they have made something which is called lambda design rules. And according to them, uh, designs uh, made according to lambda design rules have timeless quality because you can reuse them at all times. You just, you, you can change foundry, you can go to a more advanced process and the, the same design will still, still be uh, usable. And the second thing, which is maybe more important in today's, uh, uh, um, today, from the, to, to, today's per perspective, is the concept of a foundry. Because uh, before, before they introduced the concept of a foundry as, a, an, as an entity which just produces chips, it does not design them, it just produces chips. For example, today, the biggest uh, producer, the biggest pure play foundry is TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. They're not uh, rolling out their own chips. They just pr uh, produce uh, chips for other companies. But this concept at the time it was new, uh, made uh, possible uh, uh, the, the inception of fabless companies. So these are companies that just design chips, they don't manufacture them. For example, NVIDIA is one of the companies which is fabless, but is, uh, you know, one of the biggest silicon providers in the world. So you can make, uh, you can be a big silicon provider without having your own foundry. Intel, on the other hand, has its own foundries. AMD has been a uh, company which had its own foundries, then it sold it. That's how global foundries uh, became into uh, existence uh, and became a, a fabulous company. Uh, the irony in this is that now Intel is acquiring global foundries. So you can see that AMD has essentially sold its IC business manufacturing to Intel. Um, so this is, this is what we are facing. And for that reason, software tools are essential because without software tools, you cannot do anything. Please, next slide. And now I will talk briefly about uh, digital design flow, uh, specifically the uh, free and open software digital design flow, because digital design flow exists in commercial software for a long time, but those tools are so expensive that um, in, in many cases, the, the, the cost of the whole project, you know, development of, of a big chip where um, the, the physical manufacturer of the chip is measured in tens, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, is still dominated by licensing cost of the software, believe it or not. So, uh, for digital, you have several ways of uh, entering a design, so you, you know what you want to build, and now you have to specify it in some way. Uh, schematic is obsolete for the reasons of sheer complexity, as I said, Intel uh, 4004 is uh, based on schematic design, but that was almost 50 years ago. In the meantime, uh, the, one of the ways which, uh, which is used and maybe still predominantly used today is register transfer logic, uh, where you use some hardware description language such as Verilog or VHDL to specify your design intent. So you don't have to, you know, deal with every single detail, but you have, you specify what you want to do. Um, then when the designs became more, more and more complex, the people realized that, you know, this won't cut it. You, we need something even more abstractive. And UC Berkeley Chisel offers a um, higher level of, of abstraction and it is a free and open source tool. It is not a tool which works on an algorithmic level, it is, let's say, somewhere in between. And the authors uh, is, at least have insisted that this, uh, the chisel is not a high level synthesis. It is just a tool which has higher level of abstraction than pure RTL. Then you have algorithmic level tools or high level synthesis, such as where you can specify the design in C, C++, system C or, or some proprietary languages. And the tool does everything for you. So you, you, you state what you want to do almost in natural language, and then the tool design, decides how it will pipeline design the design, how it will partition it and so on. So you, you, have, to, uh, you have to know how the tool works so that you can predict uh, how you should uh, structure your code that it outputs what you want. You know, it's, it's kind of uh, reverse engineering in a sense, if you want to get high quality of, of results. 
uh, algorithmic level pools are not yet on the level that they are smart enough, smart in quotes, to um, get your in intent uh, uh, or, or all the, 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 the nuances of, in, of that de design. And free and open source tools are missing for high level synthesis. That's a big, let's say, issue in the following years because more and more things are going that, in that direction. So, uh, ex except for the schematic where you have to specify every single detail, the design intent is what is, uh, uh, let's say, specified in today's digital designs. So, the timeless quality the Conway and Mead were talking about in the 70s has, in fact, shifted uh, to um, from scalable layouts to higher levels of abstraction, to ideas. And these ideas can be made in, in different uh, ways, uh, depending on the tool you're using and the technology you're using. And here on the bottom, uh, for example, you have a, a snippet of the chisel code, which is uh, used for, for, uh, uh, for making a bus. So, you know, it's very, very high level in terms of uh, signals. So, um, Apart from design entry, you need a way to simulate the digital design because when you have, when you have very complex design, then you need to be able to um, see what it does, whether it does what you want and uh, from uh, both the point of design and also the point of uh, verification. So you have actually, let's say, two uh, broad groups of uh, uh, simulators. The, uh, one is behavioral simulators. Behavioral in the sense that apart from the hardware, they can also uh, simulate some behavioral, uh, behavioral uh, constructs such as test benches, reading from a file and so on. So that they can, you know, they, they're considered, considered to be general and also they can uh, simulate the circuit delay. So you can um, make a timing simulation in them and see whether your design uh, has some timing violation. Uh, for free and open source tools are very good for, uh, 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 for digital design simulation. Um, for Verilog, you have Icarus Verilog, which is very good, very good tool. It has decent capacity uh, and also it is considered to be of industrial strength. For VHDL, you have GHDL, which is also a very good tool. Not Maybe not as mature as Verilog, but still a very good and reliable tool. However, uh, mixed language simulators are missing. Uh, why is this important? Because um, Verilog uh, is used mainly in the industry. Uh, VHDL is Let's say it has a perception that it, it is used mainly by academia, which is of course not true. It is also widely used in the industry, but VHDL has some recent additions. Okay, maybe not so recent because it, they were in 2008, which made um, DSP much more, um, much more uh, easier to design in VHDL than Verilog. So DSP designers would stick to VHDL uh, other digital designers might stick with Verilog and then you have a problem because you, you don't have a simulator which can simulate both of those, which cannot mix those. So maybe that's, that's a piece that's missing. The other um, group of simulators is compiled simulators. So you have um, Verilog code which is compiled, which is transformed in, in some smart ways into C++ code which simulates your design. And by doing that, you can get orders of magnitude, maybe many orders, like hundreds, maybe thousands of times faster simulation than with the behavioral simulator. And this is used uh, to generate uh, bit and cycle accurate uh, simulators of CPUs and DSPs. So for example, for RISC-V, you can take the actual Verilog design, put it through a verilator, and then you get a C++ code, which executes exactly the same as it would be in the RISC-V Core. So in this way, you could simulate it booting or Linux or, or whatever. Of course, there are other options, but this is also feasible because this is a really a bit and cycle accurate design. So uh, when you have a design, you, you have entered the design, you have simulated it. Uh, now you have to make a chip out of it. And this is actually an image from the Open Road project. 
and this des describes the open lane, the open lane uh, architecture. Uh, you can see here on the left hand side, you, have, you can see that design is specified in railroad files. And on the top uh, right hand side, you can see that you have PDK. For digital design, digital design is, has greatly benefited from the fact that the uh, file formats are standardized. So you have design exchange format, you have library exchange format, you have um, Liberty, lib files, and so on, so on. So uh, everything you need for digital for digital design is actually standardized, so that uh, all tools are using the same input data. As we will see, this is not the case for analog design, and that's a major obstacle. But uh, thanks owing to this standardization, the free and open source tools can be used for the chip design. And as you can see here. We have um, RTL synthesis, which translates your, uh, or rather compiles your uh, Verilog uh, code into actual uh, uh, gates, digital gates. Uh, it does it in a loop so that it optimizes timing. After that, it goes to a physical design, it floor plans and routes the design. So it places the, the synthesized digital cells routes the metal between them, between them and so on and so on. And after that, you have verification and uh, exporting. Um, this tool is, com uh, this flow is complete. So you need, you have every single tool you need to make a digital chip and people have done so. However, there are some limitations. For example, YOSIS, which is used for digital uh, synthesis is based on ABC, which is a tool from Berkeley and it's like 20 years old, old or more. And it is missing some very, very important features which are present in commercial tools, such as pipeline retiming, where uh, the tool is allowed to move some logic between the pipeline stages to optimize the timing. And um, to illustrate, uh, I have synthesized uh, one DSP design with Yosus, with a uh, vendor provided um, synthesis tool for the FPGA and uh, with the Synopsys tool. And Synopsys and vendor provided were like in 20% margin, Synopsys was better. But uh, Yosis and, and uh, uh, Synopsis were three times. So, you know, that's, that's a huge difference. And that's uh, specifically because the Yosis cannot do, at, at least cannot efficiently do uh, red, um, uh, pipeline retiming. So this could be fixed by, you know, op manually um, changing the pipeline, but it takes too much design, design and effort. And, if you change technology, then you, you need to do it all over again and so on. Um, so uh, the, 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 other, the other thing which is very, very uh, problematic in this flow is RC extraction because it is a Python script. So capacity and accuracy is, is um, discutable. And after you do that, <coughs> you um, finish the chip with magical K, K layout. You do the top level connectivity, place IO ring, uh, check DRC and LVS, and of course, generate the layout as you can see. Analog design flow. The next one, please. So the analog design flow revolves around simulation and that's, that's, that's it. So the SPICE is the grandfather of all circuit simulators and its derivatives are still actively developed. However, the development of these derivatives has introduced the Spice Tower of Babel. You know, Tower of Babel is a God's way of punishing men for being uh, too, um, uh, I cannot remember the English word, but uh, of punishing men uh, by giving them thousand languages. Uh, in this case, you have many different uh, Spice uh, um, uh, language derivatives which are incompatible. So. You cannot, you cannot use uh, that in, in um, different simulators. And foundry provided PDKs are usually in proprietary netlist format. And this is a major obstacle because you cannot use the free and open source uh, tools for that because it cannot read the netlist. Skywater is the only foundry to date which opens, which uh, is providing the open source PDK compatible with free and open source, open source tools. And the possible solution to this problem is intermediate representation of analog circuits. So whatever netlist language you have, you put it into same intermediate representation. Whether this, uh, from a technical point of view, this is certainly possible. I'm not sure whether there would be some legal problems 
in using some proprietary format and parsing it into an intermediate format. So there are, let's say, two major uh, um, um, open source simulators in use today. One is Spice Derivative and the other one is a new implementation by Sandia National uh, Lab called Zeiss. The Spice Derivative <coughs> uses the legacy code base and architecture and the device and simulator core is are uh, coupled. So this makes a problem for extending the simulation of the simulator and uh, new implementation size uses a uh, different formulation where the core simulator and device models are completely decoupled and this makes the um, uh, design of simulator much more much more flexible the another thing which is also used uh, for very important for analog design is very gay for modeling of behavioral circuits so that you can model you know, if some device is not present in the simulator, you just model it in variable gay. There is one tool for variable gay, which is called ADMS, but uh, it does not support all of the all of the variable constructs, and it is unmaintained for a new for a long time. So a new tool for variable gay is really needed. Please next. So the extractor of parasitics are present free and open source, but only RC extraction. Our other extractors are needed for high-speed design. They're of limited capacity, so large designs can have millions of nets. That's beyond the capacity of currently available um, uh, our extractors. No support for uh, layout-dependent effects, no support for advanced nodes, and no EM simulators with acidic as a notable example because it can simulate some structures. So to summarize, digital flow is in a good shape there there is a complete digital flow however um, some tools are let's say not of best quality they need to be replaced analog design flow is far from uh, good because uh, for, ex for for the for start you cannot simulate analog designs because the, the the open source tools cannot read the pdk provided models and some tools are missing completely thank you for your attention Are there yeah. any questions? Thank you. Hmm? Dear colleague, yeah, excellent presentation. Thank you. I especially like the, the, the places that you identified that something missing in the OS community. That is some job. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience or those following us online? Oh, okay, I, uh, you concluded very. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, I, ah, okay. The question was the question was that if we use the uh, free uh, uh, if we use the commercial tool to do to synthesize the design and then use that. Uh, gate level netlist to do a placement, whether it would be, let's say, better than using the complete free open source, if I understood the question. Yeah, um, to be honest, I haven't done that because the, the example I've mentioned is for the FPGA and for the FPGA, you, 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 know, you need to rely on uh, on um, on uh, uh, proprietary tools because they don't release that information. But that would be certainly interesting to, to compare because then let's say the, the physical design tools would have a fair start. So that, that would be interesting. And thank you for, for that question. I will try it just for curiosity. curiosity. Okay, thank you. More, any more questions? Just a question. Mm -hmm. uh, which one of these tools are you using in your during lecturing on your courses? Uh, that is a good question, uh, almost none. And uh, no, no, th there is a good reason for that. Because um, I'm, all, uh, I'm made mainly involved in analog and RF design, and the free and open source tools simply cannot read the, the, the PDKs. You know, the, the uh, models provided by the foundries, real life models, are unusable. So uh, for the digital, for the digital, you might use some of these tools, and they're quite decent quality. 
But for Analog, unfortunately, uh, Skywater last year released one of the, it's still in its infancy. It, it's not, you know, for, for some serious design, you know, because um, it's still wor wor work in progress, but I hope that in the next few years it will, it will mature enough to be used in, in teaching. Thank you. Thank you very much once again. Thank you.